Hi, this is Rhett with TestingTheory.com, and today I want to talk to you about the four symptoms of being a hypothesis handicapped. I'll explain what it means to be a hypothesis handicapped, I'll also walk through a few client examples to show you what that looks like in practice, and I'll also at the end give you some self-evaluation questions to make sure that you yourself don't become hypothesis handicapped. To begin, I want to start with the definition of a hypothesis. If you just Google hypothesis, the first result is from Oxford Dictionary, at least it is right now, and the definition says this, a supposition or proposed explanation made on the basis of limited evidence as a starting point for future investigation. I want to take a second and talk about what each one of these points mean and why they're important in understanding what a hypothesis is and how to avoid becoming a hypothesis handicapped. The first thing it says that this is a supposition or a proposed explanation. This is important because it means you don't know all the answers. This is just a proposed solution. We're supposing that this thing might work. The essence of a hypothesis is the acknowledgement that you don't know the answer. But what it also acknowledges is that you're willing to try something to see if this thing works. The next important part of the definition is where it says limited evidence. This is an admission that this is just a solution that we're trying. We're admitting to ourselves that with this test and this hypothesis, we don't have a lot to go on, but we're coming up with something without a lot of evidence. The next thing that it says in the definition is that it's a starting point. This is an admission that this is the beginning of the journey and not the end of the journey. The last important part of the definition is it says that it requires further investigation. We're admitting to ourselves that we're not done after this, that there's more to learn and more to do. So let me contrast these things in the definition with the ways that I see people becoming a hypothesis handicapped. I'm going to give you four specific examples of things that I see that make them get stuck in their hypothesis. The first sign that you're hypothesis handicapped is when you only test things that you think will work. I was working with a client recently and they said to me that as we were brainstorming and coming with test ideas and we were proposing solutions of things that this client could try, the response to the client was this. They, he said, our hypothesis doesn't want to test that. This was an immediate red flag for me. I knew that my client was exhibiting the first symptom of being hypothesis handicapped. By saying that he did, the, the hypothesis didn't want to test that, essentially what they were saying to me was, we don't want to test those ideas. We have our idea that we think will work. And our one beautiful idea that we think will work is what we want to test. Again, think back to the definition. The hypothesis handicap version of saying we don't want to test that assumes that the, this isn't the starting point, this is the ending point. It assumes that we're not doing further investigation because we've already come up with a solution. You see how that's a trap. He was hypothesis handicapped because he wasn't willing to accept that his solution wasn't the best solution and that there was more to learn on the journey of optimization. The second sign that your hypothesis handicapped is when your testing revolves around a small set of variations that slightly change the main concept. I see this all the time with designers. Designers will think really hard and come up with their solution that they think is the best, and then to make it work for a test, they'll change something little about the solution, then something else about the solution, and maybe something little over here about the solution. And so they're modifying the solution that they think is the winner in just little tiny ways. This proposed solution is usually so narrow in the scope because it's already assuming that it is the right answer. When all the alternatives safely revolve around the one solution, you can be sure that you are hypothesis handicapped. The third sign that you're hypothesis handicapped is when your testing results show you exactly what you wanted to win. And then when you give the winning experience that you wanted, you stop testing. This is a classic example of confirmation bias. I just saw this recently where confirmation bias basically says that you look for the data that supports your, your worldview or your hypothesis in this case. Um, to the example I was going to tell you, so I saw this with a client where they were testing the existence of two different things that were very similar and they, they didn't think they needed both of them on the site. So when we removed one of them, it showed that the other one did just fine without that thing. So basically the, the client thought they only needed one of them, not two. And the data, the first round of tests came back and said, yeah, when you remove one of them, it doesn't make a difference. So to make sure you're not hypothesis handicapped, you have to be sure that when you're exhibiting the symptom of going with what you wanted to, what you wanted to win because it won, this is when you need to double check and triple check and make sure that you're not doing something because it's your confirmation bias that you want that to win and you think it's the winner, but you're really looking at all the angles to make sure that you're not asking a limited set of questions and stopping prematurely because you found the answer that you wanted. And that brings us to the fourth symptom of being hypothesis handicapped. That's when you simply don't do any follow-up tests or ask any additional questions after a test. 
Again, think back to the definition of hypothesis. This is the starting point for further investigation. When you stop the investigation, when your starting point becomes your end point, you can be sure that your hypothesis is handicapped. Good testing leads to more questions. It leads to more things you want to discover and figure out. But usually you run a test and you're like, wow, we could go this way or this way or that way. It leads to more questions. It is a starting point for further investigation. I want to leave you with four really great questions that will help you evaluate if you're a hypothesis handicap. If you answer no to any of these questions, then you might want to stop and pause and think if you need to course correct to make sure that you're not hypothesis handicapped. The first self-evaluation question is, are you testing things that you think won't work? If you're testing something that you think won't work, that's a really good indicator that you're trying new options, you're really exploring, and you're not stuck in a hypothesis. Question number two, are there variations that you don't like? Similar to number one, if you're, if you're testing things that you just don't like or you think won't work, that's a great way to get some self-evaluation to make sure you're challenging all the assumptions. Question number three for the self-evaluation, do your test results lead to more questions that you're unsure of? Meaning, you ran the test, and now you have more things that you don't know the answers for. There's more things that you need to try. And question number four, similar to question number three, does your test result cause uncertainty as to the direction that you should go with the results? Now, this is a tricky one. I don't want you to think that you have, you have the results that aren't clear. You want clear results, but you want those results that are clear because of a good strategic test to lead you to more unknowns that you need to then answer with further follow-up testing. So there you have it. Those are the four symptoms of being hypothesis handicapped and four questions that you can use as a self-evaluation to make sure you're not falling in that trap so that you can really truly use a hypothesis the way it should be with a starting point for further investigation where you know that you don't know all the answers, but you're letting the data guide you and to find the best answers. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give me that good thumbs up so I know that you liked it. And you can also visit me at testingtheory.com where you can learn more about testing theories and good practices for A-B testing. You can also sign up for a free consulting session with me. And remember that testingtheory.com is where you get better testing and more conversions.